And this would be Transylvania, actually. We're going to move into this. Um, this was a trip that was made to the Sibiu Club with Friendship Forest from Dallas. And this is an old map of Europe. You see that Yugoslavia is now divided up. Uh, this is um, Eastern Europe. This is the Black Sea right here, uh, Moldova, Ukraine. Hungary, Austria, uh, the Czech Republic, which now is now two, Yugoslavia is more countries. So it's an old map, but you get an idea of where it, it is placed in Europe. And this right in back of Kathleen, or in back of me, <laughs> is something I should never put up in the right corner anymore. Uh, map of all of, uh, of, all of um, Romania, plus this large place in the middle, which is Transylvania, the largest province or state in the country. You see down here very close to the bottom, Rashov and Sibiu, uh, Bucharest would be south of here, as you see. So we're looking at this area right up in here. And these are where we're gonna go. We started out in Bucharest, flying into Bucharest and, and did a couple of castles on the way up to Brasov, uh, uh, Bron Castle and Sibiu and some fortified churches. And what you're gonna see is lots of fortified things. In Sibiu, we stayed a week and had some side trips out of Sibiu. So just a little history. I'm not gonna tell you much about it because we wanna see lots of pictures, but it was settled by the Romans uh, very early on. And there were uh, Dacians living there originally. So over a couple hundred years, they intermarried and became quote, Romanians. Basically it was two countries, uh, Wallachia and Moldavia. Uh, and if you know that, that uh, Romania is a Romance language, I'm not sure how many people knew that. That if you think of the languages, you think of Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, and you say, hmm, what's the fifth one? Well, it was because the Romanians settled there and the language became Romanian uh, taken from the Latin. And it was located on continental trade and migration routes. So it, it became a place where there was a lot of where there were a lot of people coming and going, taking over, uh, settling, moving in and out, fluid borders. It wasn't even its own country really until about 150 years ago. So um, the Huns came, the Byzantines, the Hungarians, the Germans, uh, and eventually all of this was unified in 1861 with, with King Carol. We'll hear more about him a little bit. Russians came and occupied, but they left and then we had Ceausescu, who was a dictator, a uh, communist dictator who was overthrown. Uh, it is a NATO country and an EU country. The reason I bring up this history at all is because you're going to see lots of fortified things. With all these people coming and going through Romania, you're going to see lots of fortified churches, uh, fortified towns, walled towns, castles, that kind of thing. Oh, why do I have that? Hmm. It disappeared on me. Oh, here it is. <laughs> yeah, I know it came back, but it wasn't supposed to do that. Uh, so I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to make it go like it's supposed to. Okay, a little poster from Romania. <laughs> Again, the name taken from Romans and with a few scenes of Bucharest. So I said Ceausescu was a, was a dictator. So we're going to hear a lot about him because he pretty much dominates the city of Bucharest. Uh, parliament house now, but it was built as his personal palace, about 1,100 rooms, uh, built over the a, a couple of um, decades. And this is a view, obviously, that I didn't take myself. And you see a big boulevard down here. So costing it about three and a four point four billion dollars. That's with a B one of the most extravagant building projects in the history of mankind. It can be seen from outer space, in fact. And in order to do this, uh, he leveled a hill that was there and destroyed about, leveled about two and uh, almost three square miles of the old city center and re relocated people. And this included monasteries, churches, hospitals, and not just uh, houses, but some of the beautiful areas were there as well. And in, in, uh, some old churches were moved on rollers to new locations, but he hadn't planned on that. There were some um, clerics who decided that would be a good idea to not destroy those um, 
historic buildings. So this building, that his palace, has almost 4 million square feet <laughs> and uh, larger than the pyramid. Um, it, it's one of those defying things to even talk about it. The architect was a 28-year-old woman who won a competition to do this with her team of architects, uh, constructed over 13 years. Uh, has more than 3,000 rooms, but most of it's unfinished. So about 70% of the building is still empty, but they do use it for the Houses of Parliament. And there are three museums in it, a museum of art, a museum of the city, and a museum of the um, uh, Communist Party, an international conference center. So it is used. They do charge to take pictures and I'm too cheap to pay the fees. <laughs> so I get them off the internet when I get back. And there are a few rooms that are open to the public, about 30 rooms that are open to the public. So this is a, a, the, a, one of the conference rooms and you see these chandeliers. You know, if you start looking at all the, uh, this is the most of, best of, most expensive of, we could be here all day. But these are some of the rooms that are usable still in this palace that's, that's uh, used now. So the bishop's residence is next door uh, to this building. And it is the, the bishop's residence for the Romanian Orthodox Church, which is the national church. The Athenaeum is another building built in the Roman style as a concert hall, really pretty inside. So here's the front of a Romanian Orthodox Church. And as I say, the bishop's church was right next to it. So the Roman Orthodox Cathedral is a beautiful building. Uh, the, the uh, um, what do you call boulevard with the fountains leading up to it does make a nice, uh, beautiful entrance to see this palace at the end of it. It's pretty impressive. So we left Bucharest and went up to, uh, on our way up to the Carpathian Mountains, which you see in the background here. They kind of form a ring around Transylvania. In fact, the word Transylvania means trans, Across the mountains. And this mountains make kind of makes a circle inside of Romania itself. So Pelish Castle was built by King Carol. And King Carol of Romania is sort of interesting too. He isn't a Romanian at all. He's a German prince, a second son. Uh, they were related to the Bonapartes and he had gone to military school. So he was a, a German army officer. And the Romanians were looking to get out of the Ottoman Empire and so they went, uh, they, they dumped the previous king that they had and they went, went uh, shopping for a king in Germany. <laughs> Literally, you know, who's of a royal family that we, who might like to be king? Uh, and he spoke a couple of languages, but he didn't speak Romanian. But they decided he, he um, looked pretty good and uh, they proclaimed him king of Romania in 1881. And uh, this was good because he ruled 48 years, so he didn't have living children of his own. Uh, the uh, reign then went to his brother and his brother's children. But he did rule a long time and he did a lot for Romania. He helped it gain its uh, independence and his prestige and uh, beefed up his economy, established his dynasty, as I said, with his brother and built Bellish Castle. And he liked this um, area near Sinaia up in the mountains. He built it as a hunting lodge and it was one of the prettiest castles in Europe is this Baroque style. And it uh, uh, has 160 rooms, again, about a 30 or so that are open to the public, but it's still used as a residence for uh, the Romanian, whatever, uh, politicians, so to speak. But it has beautiful art in it. And um, it, it was closed for a while when the communists took over, it was reopened as a tourist attraction. It's, it's very popular. So you kind of see the hunting lodge uh, kind of um, faux, um, oh, what do I say, um, woody, woodiness, you know, not just all marble. The, uh, and, and here too, like it was a country home. But it is quite grand actually. The, the uh, courtyard is full of um, beautiful statuary and you see the mountains and, uh, around it, a nice place to be on a hot summer day to go up into the mountains. And again, no pictures inside. These are off uh, internet. And of course the color is awful, but it is a grand style place inside. <clears throat> and, and we had uh, a little tour of that building and had lunch in nearby Sunaya. This is the doorway going into it, into the restaurant. 
uh, with some carved wooden figures, which would be typical of that area of that era, area, excuse me. And the plates too are typical with the painted uh, pictures of people in their native dress. We have some of the local fauna uh, plates on the walls, the decorated plates, some of the souvenirs if you wanna bring some home, we had some musicians. And, and little shopping of course outside where you can buy some of that kind of stuff. I have some Romanian Easter eggs, which you see in the basket, and we'll see some more uh, here pretty soon. The other castle we visited was Braun Castle, which Kathleen talked about as being the Dracula Castle, or is known as Dracula's Castle. <clears throat> it was built uh, much earlier than Pelish Castle, as you see, 1400s, and so it is not quite as plush. In fact, it's uh, it, it would be um, substandard uh, housing if we decided to stay overnight, you might say. So he was three-time king at different periods, some, sometimes in between he was imprisoned. So he was Vlad Draculesta, or meaning son of the dragon, or more likely Vlad Tepish, or which he get, became known as, uh, as Vlad the Impaler. And uh, you don't want to know why he was known as the Impaler. <clears throat> he wasn't too kind to his uh, enemies that he captured. You might say, we, we probably won't go there any further. <laughs> Known for cruelty, yes. Um, he's thought to be the, the uh, or the, the castle is thought to be the uh, site of the, of the Bram, Bram Stoker's uh, novel, Dracula. In fact, uh, Bram Stoker didn't even know about this castle when he wrote it, but it seemed to kind of fit the bill after the fact. Here I go again, I'm off of it again. Well, let's try again. Now, where am I? <laughs> uh, how am I getting this back all the time? I'm sorry. All right, let's try right here. There we go. <clears throat> so here we are coming up to it as many castles are, was built on top of a hill. Some of our people waiting to go in. It has an interior courtyard, like, like as I said, many things were fortified. Uh, but you see how much simpler inside it is than what we saw at Pelish Castle. A couple hundred years makes a lot of difference. And it's decorated in not necessarily what, what was originally there, but things from that period are things that are similar to what, would, what kind of furniture would have been in a castle like that. <clears throat> Wood carving, of course, was very popular. And these stoves made of tiles would, would be the heat for the rooms. And here's that interior castle with me quite a bit younger, <laughs> as we all have a problem with, I think. <clears throat> Our next stop was getting to Brashoff. The reason we had a stop in Brashoff overnight was because we had um, hosted a group from Brashoff first, from Romania. But when we went back, we didn't go to Brashoff, we went to uh, Sibiu. So Poyana Brashov is the ski resort that's just 60 miles outside of Brashov. So they have that ski resort since they're so close to the mountains. I'm trying to get my little clicker where I won't get off of it again. Very bad picture from the internet of how it looks in winter. This is, this is the way it looked when we were there. Of course, we were there in summertime. So we have a nice big Hollywood type sign. Uh, and the hillside in Brashov, which you can see from the downtown area. Brashov is one of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, as, as is Sibiu and Siguara and Sigishwara and a couple other places we're going to see. There are so many preserved places in, in Romania that um, many of them have that UNESCO heritage uh, site. <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> so we are now in the old town. Um, you see the um, dates on some of the buildings and the tile roofs. So the, the, this uh, main square dates back to the 15 and 1600s mostly. <clears throat> um, you, you might notice that I'm, I'm pronouncing this like an SH. If you see that little squiggle under an S, that's an SH in, uh, in Romanian names. 
This church you see in the background is one of the largest Gothic churches in, in Eastern Europe uh, called the Black Church. And the reason it's called the Black Church is because it, uh, there, it burned in uh, the 1689, I believe it was. And, um, and so it, it wasn't originally that color. It, would be, it became uh, very discolored from smoke and parts of it have been cleaned and parts of, of bricks have been replaced. So it's not a uniformly black church anymore, rather plain inside, however. <clears throat> this was an interesting sign that we liked, uh, probably the best city in the world. I thought, well, can't they make up their mind? I mean, in our Texas, you would have said, well, we're the world's best city, right? No, we're probably the best city. <laughs> we, we could have got a big bang out of that. Probably the best city. So here we are back in the, in the main square. And as I say, we were there just uh, for two days to, to see the sights of Brush Off and visit with our friends. <clears throat> uh, this was the couple that I hosted it when they were in Dallas back in 2000, maybe five. And we're still in contact with uh, on Facebook. Um, Marius is a editor of a newspaper there and editor runs the um, orphan uh, group home situation. So are some of the things you might be interested in buying in brush up if you were interested in the crafts, some of the native dress, uh, not to be called costumes because they're not for dress up, they are native dress. And we're looking at one of the fortified citadel, which is what that means, part called Fagarash. Oh, and I can't see where it was built. Uh, 17... It was 1310. In part where? It was built in 1310. 1310. Okay, I'm seeing your face in front of it. This problem. <laughs> oh, we can see all of it. At least I can. Oh, I, well, I can't see that. Um, <clears throat> And it's pretty, pretty grim. Uh, it hasn't been updated or um, had as much renovation done on it as some of the others that we'll see. But you see that it had been plastered. <clears throat> and what, what would happen with a citadel or a fortified church is that you would have thick walls around. So one of these marauding trips, the Huns or whoever happened to be passing through, you would gather the villagers inside. There were apartments alongside storerooms of food so that um, you could be. Um, <clears throat> be safe while they were coming through. Of course, you had to uh, pay attention to the laws. <laughs> they did have uh, things that you had to be careful of. The uh, Harmon, on the other hand, is, is much better um, preserved than Fagarash is, which you see in the picture here. And we visited that one as well. <laughs> it has walls and a moat. You can see what happens when you actually plaster over. It looks a little nice, nicer. And the apartments that would have been inside and hopefully you wouldn't have to extend uh, too long a siege and they would move on, but you could bring your animals in and everything. Uh, nearby is the Church of St. Nicholas and its cemetery. Uh, these paintings are typical of Russian Orthodox, but you'll see them everywhere going into the church. They're very flat, you know, they, you don't see much perspective in them. <clears throat> and pictures on the wall going into the church. Uh, Sibiu, you might, you might also have uh, heard it called Ermenstad, which is the German name for Hermann's town. And uh, that's because there was a large population of Saxons who moved to this area from Germany. And the Saxons spoke, you've heard of Anglo-Saxon uh, being in English, uh, where our English comes from. So the, they, many of the people who were coming from Sax Saxony still do speak a Saxon language today. It's, it's similar to English, but, but very German, uh, German as well. So here is a Sibiu, Ermenstad, uh, being the cultural capital of Europe in 2007. So I've said to um, uh, uh, Kathleen before we decided to do this that uh, Romania is really uh, bypassed by a lot of tourists, which is a shame because uh, it was the uh, cultural capital of Europe. Uh, certainly lots to see and do, and it, along with Luxembourg that year. <clears throat> and the, the uh, Brukenthal um, building right here is now a museum. It was originally a resident of the, the top man in town, the town hall and the Catholic cathedral. <clears throat> they all have their big squares. 
And you'll notice to the eyes of, on, on the uh, windows, you'll see those several places. Right, some views from the square. There's, it's called the House of Five Eyes, so it's watching over the square. <clears throat> and there are several squares. The big square is the one we're in right now. Uh, but there are several other squares that we'll be seeing. As I say, the Brukenthal Museum has a uh, lovely um, uh, history, uh, lots of artifacts from the region going back to the 1400s. The town hall and the Jesuit church, a very lovely church. And this one leads into another, this little archway leads into another square, which we see right here, Hewitt Square. Also <clears throat> going back to that same era. The uh, Evangelical ch uh, Church is the Lutheran, uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church. And there are several pictures of that because it, these towers, um, it has five towers on it that rather dominate the city uh, skyline. So wherever you go, you seem to see the uh, highlight, the uh, towers of the Evangelical Churches. Here's another square, the small square. We had a little uh, um, <clears throat> concert at the music school and uh, past the Gong Theater, which has this uh, interesting, I don't know what it's made of, iron or wood or something, a little concert at the music school. I won't uh, bore you with all the little four-year-olds uh, doing their ballet, but, but you may, or may or may not know that the pan pipes or Zamponia is not only from the Andes Mountains, but also from Romania. So those two countries are the countries uh, that you might find this particular music instrument. <clears throat> so, we, of course, we did a lot of walking in the town to see the, the lovely buildings, and here's the uh, Caryatids house. You see those also in the, uh, on the uh, Athenian Acropolis. Another church, this is the church that is the main, uh, the um, official church in Romania, the Romanian Orthodox. You may say, well, isn't that Greek or Russian? Well, each of the countries has their own Orthodox Church. Yes, they are the Eastern branch of the Catholic Church when they split into the Western um, Pope in Rome and the Pope in, uh, in uh, Const Constantinople at that time, Istanbul. So you have the Turkish Orthodox, the Greek, the Roman, Romanian, and so forth. So the, each country now has their own head, head person. <clears throat> and looking at the front of that, again, these uh, paintings in the Orthodox churches. <clears throat> and you, you'll see icons. We did see some icons in the Orthodox Church. This one's from the, the large square that we were just in, across the Bridge of Lies into another one. You might say, well, why is it called the Bridge of Lies? Well, there are all kinds of stories about that. The main one being, if you tell a lie on the bridge, it's going to fall down. But there are all kinds of others, like about lying to your lover and things like that. So this covers uh, over the strad and I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Ogne, which runs down below it. And that is going to the lower town, which is actually the oldest part of Sibiu, this passageway down into the lower town. And you see buildings that look even older than what we saw up, up, up top in the square. 13th century, uh, some of the signs, the tiles on the roof, they all gives it away that this is an old part of town. Uh, this late 16th century, and the oldest one is supposed to be this one right here, which is now a restaurant, uh, back to the 13th century. Uh, Sibiu was also a walled town, as I said, like many of these towns were, and different guilds in the town. Of course, you had to be a guild to be in and to, get, to have any kind of business. It's like belonging to the union. Uh, the carpenters uh, built this tower. It's an octagonal tower, which is sort of unusual. But they built fortifications, the different guilds built fortifications and towers to uh, guard these cities. And this original part of the wall is still there. It's not completely walled anymore, but it does have part of it that's been restored. And this is the other end of that. You'll see the uh, Carpenter's Tower on that end. <clears throat> this is where we stayed with our host. Uh, I thought this house was interesting because it didn't have a living room. <laughs> It had a dining room and it had a downstairs master bedroom, but it didn't have a living room. 
Uh, these were our hosts, Vera and Tony. Tony is the president of that club and still is, I guess, for life. And uh, my traveling buddy, Teresa. But they, they gathered up on the back porch. So it was uh, this um, uh, porch that they could open up to screen porch in the summertime. Uh, one of their daughters, her brother, another daughter. And so they ate out there and they had some chairs around and uh, they pretty much lived on the porch year round. No, no living room. I wish I had a polenta dish in this one. This seemed to be very popular. We had it at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it seemed. Kind of an orange, I mean, a, a, a corn mush that was baked, a cornbread kind of uh, polenta. You'll see it in the grocery stores. You can make it. Uh, I should have um, warned you about that, but I don't think you want polenta as a recipe, though. <laughs> but we did eat a lot of it. Um, one of the interesting things out just outside of town is the Ostra Outdoor Museum, and it, it has a it's an acronym for whatever it is for for this the traditional uh, the traditional outdoor museum, and at least they call them that in Europe. They, an outdoor museum is a collection of buildings. In Dallas, we have a heritage park where we've gathered up historical buildings and put them outside for you mm. to. Uh, Enjoy, and that's what's in this park. It's an outdoor museum of buildings, you see with a little lake and all, uh, a type of church that they might've had uh, back in the day. So it's to, to conserve these uh, folk culture that, that um, is disappearing as these buildings start crumbling, they need to be um, rehabilitated from time to time. So like many of the Saxon villages, which we're gonna be visiting, uh, you'll, be, you'll see in the village, um, the horse and buggy. And the Saxons, uh, as I was saying earlier, who came from Germany, um, live not much like our Amish do. And they, they have the horse and buggies and uh, have their own customs and language still. The lake that's there, it's the largest open air ethnographic exhibit in Europe. And I've been to some others in Norway that were really nice too. So there's this collection of buildings from all over Romania, uh, particularly the peasant culture, uh, but also not only houses, but um, different kinds of um, crafts and uh, type of woodworking and uh, different kinds of um, things that they would do to, on a farm to be self-sufficient. Mary, do they, are they staffed and are people trying to do the things the way they did? In some of them, yes. Um, we didn't see too much of that when we were there. Now, in I'll show you some at the end where they're doing some baking and uh, needlework and things like that. But yes, they they do have some people in the houses. Uh, this would be an oven back in here, <clears throat> and we see those dishes again. They like the painted dishes, the crafts. But blue seemed to be a favorite color. I think it's um, a color we see in in uh, Portugal a lot and some other places, Mexico. That seems to be a favorite color. Here's some of the uh, wool and spinning things that you would need if you're making your own clothes. Of course, you would have sheep as well and uh, different animals. And these are plastered over. You see the, the wood uh, in here, with, they, they didn't use nails. They're all just um, fitted together. As I say, this was one of the, the things that they were, uh, some of the food that they were making. And you see some of the kinds of dress in different villages uh, would vary a little bit. And this was from a book, a picture from a book. Again, some of the things that they're crafting with uh, needlework. These are some of the Easter eggs, painted Easter eggs that are very popular as souvenirs that they, they used as well. So we're back to Transylvania. And there you can see a little bit better how much of Romania it takes up, quite a bit. And what we're going to see next. So we're in Sibiu and we're there for a week. So we're going to take some sightseeing trips to these places right here. Sigishwar is another UNESCO heritage sites built on top of three hills, actually. Uh, Bertan and Medish are um, uh, walled places again. I'm going to come back to Alba Iulia. Uh, these are the Saxon villages down here. Alba Iulia is um, uh, the um, place where the or, uh, Romanian Orthodox Church has its headquarters, and it was also a Roman fort. So it's an interesting city in several ways. So we did several side trips. This is Sigishwar. <clears throat> in Dallas, by the way, I ran into uh, a young man who was running a chocolate shop down in, in Oak Lawn, 
And uh, he, I said, I heard you were from Romania. And he said, yes. And I said, oh, where? I've been there. And he said, Sigis And I said, well, I've been there. And he was so excited. I don't think he'd ever met anybody who had ever even heard of his little town. Uh, about 20, 27,000, something like that. So it comes from the, the Hungarian name, Segis Vlar, where Var is a fort, no surprise there. As I said, it was a walled city and this had walls all around it. It's still occupied, not, uh, not too many of the walled cities still have their walls or are still occupied, Segis Vlar is one. And as I was saying before, like the guilds, the guilds built the wall and the towers. So this was the Taylor's Tower right here. Now, of the 15 towers, only nine remain plus the clock tower, which we're going to see. So actually 10 of the uh, towers still remain. So this is Museum Square, meaning the museum that's in the clock tower. And we're going to see that these streets are not paved, interestingly enough, on, in that upper town. So the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Bron Castle occupant, Vlad Tefish, his father was, was uh, actually uh, exiled here at one point and lived in this house. He was Vlad Dracul. So this is another one of the towers and gates. And I'm not sure which guild this one was for. But look at the road here. Um, they were paving, starting to pave some of the streets. Now, as I said, Sigishwar is built actually on three hills. This is the middle, middle uh, section that we're gonna see up above the uh, church and high school, and then a, a lower town. Oops, I don't want to get off of that again. <laughs> Some of the things you might buy in Sigishvara. You always have the uh, shoppers. But here's that, that dirt, dirt street in the main street. So Mary, these buildings are all occupied, people live in them? Yes, ma'am, they do. There, there are shops in them. There are government buildings. So this one has a flag on it. It's probably one of the government offices, city council or something. Uh, but yes, the people live in this uh, old, old city. So this is the clock tower, which is the, the famous one. And the, the square is not really a square. It's kind of like a wide place in the street more than anything. Here's to so that Vlad house, uh, Vlad's father's house was right next to it. But you can't uh, bring your bus in there. Uh, you have to park it outside the walls and walk in. So the tower is built in 1360. It is a clock tower, but right now this, these um, floors are the, the town museum. And they have the little people that go around like you see in German clocks. Built in the 13th century, one of the four few towns that's still occupied. And this goes under the clock tower down in the lower town. So we're gonna do that in a minute. We went first of all to see the museum and to see the view from the top. And one of the towers adjacent to it, uh, you can see the town below. And also, the, um, this is the high school up on the hill, one of the other towers. So some great views from there, from on the top of the tower. And of course, the walls don't include the, include the whole city anymore. This was a, a big uh, population boom from back in the 1300s. <laughs> so we're back down now in the lower town and the lower town's got tile or, or stone or something, you know, cobblestone streets. So I don't know why they never paved the upper town, but anyway, it's probably done by now. Another one with the eyes. So here we are going up the 187 steps to high school. Wouldn't you like to do that every day or to go to church? Uh, church on the hill, uh, the uh, cemetery on the hill. So we're leaving uh, Sigishwara now going on to Birtan, which again is another fortified church up on top of a hill. That's your best place to be safe with big thick walls. I'm going to race through these because it's like, what, another fortified church? <laughs> it's kind of like another one you're going down the Nile, you know, another bloody museum, another, you know, whatever. So yeah, they're there are a lot of them. This is a particularly pretty one though. Inside it has been maintained and it does have a nice museum in it. So there are um, some, some nice uh, exhibits to see in their museum. And those um, tile uh, 
stoves. Another citadel of Mediash. Now this was the town, the walled town. You can see the walls along here. Uh, it would have gone around this way uh, from 1810. And you can still see the steeple and uh, the town is partially walled now. But it again is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. They're, they're just um, crawling with them. And the Saxon villages, now they're a little bit different. Now we've got a big Hungarian population, about a third, about a third Romanian and about a third German. And the, the many of them are in this region in the Saxon villages. And if they're the, the really um, Saxon as, as still um, adhering to all their ancient customs, uh, the houses look very much like this. They're flat at the front or, or enclosed courtyards in the back. Uh, you'll see lots of horses and buggies. Um, interesting um, architecture. It's a little different than, than what you see elsewhere. One of the towns that we stopped in was uh, Seteak Kalnik. Again, a fortification. It had a, a, two, a double wall. And it was a private residence. Built in 1271 as a private residence. And, uh, had a moat and a drawbridge. Boy, this guy kept, uh, kept very safe, but big enough to bring in the townspeople. Christiane was another village we, we stopped at. And there was a little lady that took care of this Saxon church. These are Lutheran churches. Uh, she, she happened to be in uh, watering the plants and doing whatever she needed to do and let us uh, see the inside of this lovely church. <clears throat> some decorative items from farther back, or for, for a little more recently rather, uh, some of the storehouses inside the uh, walls. And the only stork we saw in Romania, but they do have them. Uh, Sibio was an interesting little town. Uh, again, some of the uh, horse and buggies that you might see if you're in the area. They had an icon museum. And as I said, they are very, uh, very popular in the Orthodox churches all over the, all over the world. And these icons, uh, are, uh, they have about 700 icons. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to show you all of them. Uh, you know, you, you've seen a few hundred icons, you've seen a lot. <laughs> so, uh, but that, that they are icons from the Orthodox uh, tradition and some of the Saxon type of clothing. <clears throat> There's a well in the village. This is the horse trough. So if your horse needs some water, you just pull up and let him have a drink. And grandpa with the little one. Now some things never change. So our last stop is Alba Iulia. And compared to some of the older buildings, um, some of this looks pretty modern and it is <coughs> after you discount the Roman uh, fortress. <coughs> So this was uh, built as a <clears throat> on top, right on top of where the Roman fortress used to be. First, the Catholic Church from the 12th to 13th century. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then going to the Romanian Orthodox um, headquarters, so to speak. And th this is their gateway into the, uh, their little compound. Their Orthodox Church, of course. <clears throat> And we see the, the type of um, Orthodox um, kinds of painting uh, in gold, of course, on this one <clears throat> of the cathedral door. It's also the seat of their seminary for Orthodox uh, priests and the back of it. So this was the original Roman uh, fortress. And you see this now is, is taken up here with the Orthodox church that we just saw, the Catholic church and so forth. So there are several layers of it with cannons, and some of it is, uh, or cannons later on is, is uh, it was still in use. <clears throat> but you can still see the outline of it. Uh, and um, this is the gate that you're gonna be seeing in just a minute. This is the gate that was later um, built in this nice fancy one. This was not Roman, obviously. These, these are the Roman walls, however, next to it. <clears throat> and they do have a changing of the guard. 
So it was a military fortress as well, not only from the Roman walls, the original Roman walls, but, but adding on to it and making it a military uh, center later on. <clears throat> so they're doing their changing of the guard ceremony here. Doing a little construction work uh, while I'm here. <clears throat> and this is the exit from that area and the end of our trip to Romania. Wow. Let's see. Um, I do have um, <clears throat> this kind of goes back a little bit, but when Jack, do you want to just go ahead and ask your question? You have some in the chat? Yes. Okay. I did have one, but I was wondering, you know, because we've been following the news back in 89 about um, Nikolai and Elena Ceausescu getting huh. captured and executed. Was it right after that then it stopped being a communist country and, and opened up to travel? Okay, um, yeah. There wasn't a lot of travel to Romania and, uh, until the Russians left. Now, remember, they invaded Hungary in, in um, 1958, and they also invaded yeah. Romania at that time. Uh, but the uh, communist leaders who were appointed at that uh, time got them to leave. So there were then Romanian um, strongmen, and Ceausescu was one of them. But he encouraged... Uh, uh, travelers and, and tourism, particularly to some of these, uh, um, the Pelish Castle and Braun Castle and so forth, and, and started fixing some of these places up. And once he got his grand palace <laughs> opened up, uh, you know, that was not open to the public then, but of course it became open to the public later. But yeah, so he encouraged uh, um, tourism. And Particularly after 1989, he was overthrown in 1989 with, with uh, 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 revolts. Of course, you can imagine the people in Bucharest who, who were who had their houses leveled weren't really happy with him, <laughs> and he bankrupted the country. And they were under uh, very strict um, uh, measures to conserve money. And and Romania was very poor for a long time, and so you know they, they did want to encourage money coming into the country. So Romania was very poor. This is when you hear about the orphanages and be, being in such bad shape and the children had hardly anything to eat and some were adopted out of Romania at that time. So uh, he, he really bankrupted the country doing his big project. But he was finally overthrown in, in 1989, in, in December, actually in December, and uh, with protests in several other towns and then in Bucharest itself, and as I was showing you the, um, the newspaper editor who was my guest, and then we saw again in Russia, uh, he was a student at that time in 89 and was one of the people in Bucharest who was storming the palace. So uh, he, there was inner courtyards. They were, uh, Ceausescu Nikolai and his wife were evacuated by helicopter, uh, but when they landed, they were arrested by the police. Um, they were summarily tried and executed on the spot, uh, firing squad. So this was on Christmas Day of 1989. Uh, and after that, they did, um, did have more uh, democratic government and are really coming back from all of that. But they've had a very long and tumultuous history. You know, as I say, they weren't really even a country until the late 1800s. So, um, with, with all these different people coming and going, and including the Russians, and then having a dictator uh, rule after that, who um, did a lot of bad things for the country, bankrupted it, and, and starved people. But it's coming along pretty well now. And they can um, certainly use your tourist dollars. <laughs> there is a question um, that might go more for actually people traveling there. Um, David Palmentier was wondering that in the different towns you traveled, did you meet many locals and did they speak English as a second language? We met locals, so we stayed with locals, we had dinner with locals, um, we had local guides. Uh, yes, many people did speak English. Uh, the dominant languages, as I say, were Romanian, German, and Hungarian. 
um, the the wife of uh, uh, Edith, the, the um, lady who stayed with me, was of Hungarian descent. She did speak Hungarian, but yes, English is taught in the school, so there is uh, there are a lot of people that do speak English. Um, probably the le the fewest might be in the Saxon villages. They tend to speak uh, their own language, this uh, dialect of German German English, kind of, uh, and very often they don't speak even Romanian. Um, they, they might speak German and, and, Engl and English rather okay. than. Okay. Um, Stan and Sandra asked, did people talk about, and I can't say his name, the, the Sessu yes, yes. time, and did he allow churches to stay open during his rule? Uh, he did, which, which was interesting too, I think. Um, like when, when, when this um, part of uh, Bucharest was uh, basically raised so he could put up his big palace and these churches were moved, uh, he didn't object to that. Um, it, was, it was the clergy that got these <laughs> acts together. They put down railroad tile and moved these churches, but he didn't care so much that if people went to church or not, he didn't seem to care one way or the other. Uh, so they weren't ever closed. Uh, I think the, the main problem was there wasn't money to keep them in good shape. So a lot of them ended up being torn down or uh, just falling into disrepair because there just wasn't money for restoration and upkeep on them. Some of them are pretty old. But okay. more money is coming in to do that. And as I say, the, there are so many of them now that are UNESCO heritage sites and more money is coming in to uh, restore some of these places. Okay. Um, Stan also writes, um, or Sandra, Montreal has a wonderful connection to Romania. It was here that Nadia Comaneci won her perfect tens in the Olympics. True, true. So. They, they are known for uh, musicians, particularly uh, Eugene Ionesco and uh, others. Um, Composers and musicians, uh, athletes, um, yeah. Okay. Well, does anyone else have any? Somebody with a hand. Who had a hand up a minute ago? You know what? That was Hank waving goodbye. Okay. I think he needed to go ahead and leave. Okay. So, um, Deborah, do you have a question? Yeah. Chris, yeah. Mary, that was so interesting. Thank you. Tell us more about about the eyes on the rooftops, the little windows. Do you um, the little? I don't, have a, I don't have a story for the windows. I just think they're interesting. They were pointed out to us, or I might not have even noticed that they were like that. But yeah, they look like they're just kind of peeking out of the roof. They look like they're looking at you. Once you notice them, you say, oh, those eyes are looking at me. I, I don't know if there's a story of why they're made like that. I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer that. David? Yeah. Now, Mary, I have another question. Uh, in our uh, cruising days, we met many staff that were working on the ship from Romania. Uh, yeah. Their English was very good. They're very nice and polite. Uh, but do you find that many of the people do uh, emigrate out of Romania to other parts of the country or the world uh, that uh, they're looking for, quote unquote, a better life as a result of you know, emigrating rather than staying in Romania. Well, that was definitely the case for a lot of years. As I was saying, like even the, the orphans were, were farmed out because they couldn't take care of them. Um, yes, a lot of people left, left the country and, and moved to different places. Um, I think more of them are staying now and trying to rebuild. At least that's what I got from, from um, this couple that I had hosted. They had teenage daughters, so they were much younger than me. Uh, but they were trying to rebuild the country. You know, their friends their age, like in their uh, 40s, 50s, were um, entrepreneurs and, and trying to uh, upgrade houses and starting businesses and things like that. So um, not so much leaving, I think, as much as they used to. Okay. Um, thank you. Good question, David. Um, so Stan and Sandra are wondering if you had any remembrances of food you ate there other than the polenta. <laughs> Anything special? As far as food? We ate a lot of stuff. We, we normally eat and uh, salads and vegetables. 
they had trouble feeding a vegetarian. You know, I'm a vegetarian, so they had meat at every meal. Uh, so my host, Tony, said, pizza. And every single place we went out for eat to eat, he would order a pizza for me until I could not look at pizza anymore. And I said, I don't want any more pizza. <laughs> so uh, three days in total, Mary, were you in Romania? Pardon me? How many days total were you in Romania? You sound like you spent quite a few. We were there about 10 days, a week in Sibiu and, and uh, then a couple of days on between Bucharest and Russia. Uh, did you fly into and out of Bucharest then? Yes, yes. Actually not out. Uh, most, most people did go back to Bucharest, um, but I went on to Hungary to meet a friend who lives in uh, Budapest. So I took a train from, from Sibiu to, Bucharest, to uh, Budapest. So there is good nice. train service and bus service and things like that.